Okay, uh, please welcome with Norm's presentation and hold on. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Better Python Testing with Nimoy. My name is Norm Tanner. And if you drop into the console and type in who am I, you'll find out that I've been hacking around for the past 15 years, both professionally as a hobbyist. I'm working currently for a company named Healthy.io, which is a pretty good company to work for. And you can follow me on Twitter at Noam Tene, and also follow my work on Medium and on GitHub using the Noam T username. So today, I'd like to speak to you about a small framework I've been developing in the past couple of years. Framework is named Nimoy. Nimoy named after Leonard Nimoy, the actor of Spock in Star Trek, the TV show. And what Nimoy strives to do is to make testing more fun. And it does that by creating a testing DSL, which is friendlier to humans than the other sort of testing frameworks that we have today in Python. So what I'm going to do today is going through some very common testing concepts uh, uh, generally and also in Python specifically, and compare our current solutions to what Nimoy can offer us in terms of those concepts. So first off, Many of you are probably familiar with the concept of TDD, Test Driven Design or Test Driven Test uh, Development. Now, TDD began as a concept of the extreme programming movement way back in the 1990-somethings, but it was also further developed and popularized by Kent Beck in the early 2000s. What it basically means is first you write tests. It strives to write better code by first testing the code and only then implementing the code. This is under the assumption that your tests kind of make you face the real world before you even start writing the code. So you have this sort of idea in your mind of how you want your uh, uh, code to behave and you can express it verbally. You want say maybe you know that you want a system that gives you output X when you input Y and only then you want to implement it. But first you can write a test which says, when I input X, I expect to get Y. And this supposedly, but also it was proven in the field, this shortens the time of development and the time of feedback in your development. So this is fairly popular. And I'd like to touch on another concept called BDD. So some of you may be familiar by BDD. BDD meaning behavior driven development. Behavior driven development is an extension of TDD and it says don't only test first, but try to express your business needs through your tests. That means you have to take the business or the core concepts of your business or your requirements and express those using tests. This is also supposedly meant to uh, uh, narrow the difference between your actual business logic and your business. And the way that tries to do it in BDD is having the business side express what it needs to happen using uh, human text, free text, and then somehow try to reflect that on your code using a DSL. So a core concept of BDD is the structure, okay, meaning you have a scenario which gives you a description, a human text description of what your problem is or what it is that you are looking to test. And then you have three main keywords who you would see repeating out throughout this presentation, given, when, and expect. This is the foundation of BDD. The behavior is given a certain state, you expect that when an action is performed, something else will happen. Or if a user logs into your system, that's the state, when that user clicks on a certain button, you expect something to happen. So how is it expressed? If you look into the Python world and you want to look into BDD, you have a nice framework called Behave. Behave strives to solve this issue by first having you write a Behave feature text file. This is a text file which is structured. You describe a certain feature using text. You describe a certain scenario uh, which is maybe the description side of things, the human side of things. And then you see again the three keywords of BDD, 
given, when, and then, or given, when, and expect. So the keywords describe the scenario, and the input to the right describes, well, what is it that actually is meant to happen. And so if you take these keywords and you take this input text using the behave Python framework, then you can write your test and you can see that the test using the behave framework matches the text in the feature file. So you can see again, given when and then, and then the text of the scenario, when we given we use behave, when we write specs, expect something to happen, which is then behave runs the tests. So you can see that the code matches the keywords in the text file. And this is supposed to strive to bridge the gap between business and code or business and developers. And it has this sort of idea that business people will write the behave feature file and the coders will write the text file. And that is how we bridge the gap. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I never seen in my life business people write test. Maybe you have, lucky you, I never have. Now, it's still a bridge that gaps between the two concepts. And Nimoy, as a framework, tries to unify them. Let's see how Nimoy tries to unify them. If we look at the very small example, a very basic example, this is how Nimoy does BDD. You can see that you have the same keywords given and expect inside your code, not separate. And if we look at the test file, we can see a few small things which you should notice. First off is that the extension of the file ends with spec.py, spec short for specification. This is a common uh, uh, keyword in BDD word. The specification is like a test. Then you can see that the test class extends the specification class. This is how Nimoy gives you the sort of tools and the power and does all the magic behind the scenes. And finally, you can see that the keywords that we've seen as uh, uh, annotations or as text files are actually contained inside the code. So Nimoy does BDD, but without separating the two into text and code, everything inside the code. So the same steps that we see, given and expect, are contained here, but in with blocks, because after all, it's a DSL, but it still needs to adhere to uh, Python concepts of code. Another nice thing is that if a uh, given doesn't match your sort of scenario, then you can always use an alias. You can use set of instead of given. It's equal, it's the same, it's just an alias, but sometimes it works more naturally with your language. And there's also the extended version of BDD and Nimoy, which is a stimulus and a response. So a stimulus is when something happens, then we expect an outcome. And this is exactly the same structure. You can see with, you can see when, and you can see when. So when and then replaced expect in this. So if you use given and expect, it's given something happens, then expect an outcome. But here it's a bit more complex because we want to describe a certain setup and set that up in the block. And then we want to describe the stimulus when something happens, and then the response then make certain assertions. And so Nimoy gives you this very clear separation of responsibilities within your test, but still keeping the language natural. And if we look at the very trivial test case, this is what it looks like. In the setup, I say A equals 5, when the stimulus is when A equals A plus 1, and the response is my assertion A equals 6. Now you notice something, there's an assertion, with no assert keyword. This is under the concept of reducing as much boilerplate as possible. We write tests, we want to enjoy writing tests. We don't want to suffer writing them, right? So Nimoy tries to shed all those unneeded keywords and all this unneeded boilerplate to make testing easier. And so any equality expression that you put inside the then block, you don't have to give the assert key. It's already translated as assert. So assert that A equals six. Now, what about data-driven testing? A lot of time you find yourself repeating your test case, but with different sets of data or different scenarios. The test case is the same. You can think of it like a template, but only the data changes. 
This is also a sort of evolution of DDD because you see that the scenario is exactly the same. Scenario, given, when, expect, but now we have a new keyword, we have where. And so if you think of given, when, and expect as a template, which can be run no matter the input, you can think of where as the source of that input, okay? So where feeds data into your test case, which is comprised of given, when, and expect. So this solution exists in Python as well. If you use PyTest, you can use a parameterize feature. And parameterize basically means you can take a test case and repeat that test case for a set of inputs. And the way this works is first you declare the inputs. So you can see the first row is script and the result. That describes our input parameters. And then the array that follows basically is fed into that test case with every entry. So this test case will be run twice, first with 2 times 21, and then with a cast of int of 0 point lead times 10,000. And this will run twice. Now, if you ask me personally, this is barely readable. Yeah, it's helpful, it's powerful, it's a very good feature. We need it but it looks very hard to read and it's also very hard to maintain. So how does Nimoy tackle this, you ask yourself? Well, let me show you. First off, we continue to maintain the structure. We have our blocks have been an expect, but now we have a new block called where. And this where now describes a table of values. You can think of it sort of a table or a matrix. It's called matrix in, in the uh, DDT world. And if you look at it like a table or a spreadsheet, you can see that the web block has a list with columns. The first row describes the column names or the variable names of the inputs. And all the rows that follow are the values. So every row after value A and value B are the iterations. The first iteration will give 2 and 5 as input. The second iteration will give 2 and 21 as input. And you can see that it's described in a much more graphical, much more human understandable uh, uh, way, a table, which we're all used to see in our day-to-day -day work. So you can see that the where block describes and declares the variables. This is where the variables are set their value. And then the variables are input into the method using the method signature. Now, the nice thing of having a DSL is that you don't need the boilerplate of value A and value B. Value A and value B are already described inside the body of the test. So why do we need the method signature? Well, we don't. Same test case can be written exactly the same, where you declare the variables in the where block, same as before, but the variables are injected directly into the test template. So you don't have to put them into the signature itself. Now, like I said, this is a matrix example. This is what happens when you want to describe your data as a matrix or a table. But this doesn't fit every scenario, right? Because sometimes you have different cases of data which don't always fit into a table. This is why Nimoy has a solution for lists as well. You can write the exact same uh, test case using lists instead of a table. So you can see we have the where block. And now value A and value B are set as lists. And every iteration of this test case will go over the list and use the corresponding indices and feed that into the test case. So the first iteration will go to index 0 of these arrays, 2 and 5. The second iteration will go to index 1 of these arrays using 2 and 21. And it's exactly the same way, but you can describe your data in a different shape. Again, making it more human friendly. Now, mocking is also a very uh, a popular concept in testing. I don't think many test frameworks today come without a mocking infrastructure. It's become a very popular and very common way of testing complex systems because you don't always want to test the full system. Sometimes you want to test small fragments. And if you look at the very simplified test case of unit test, that's the test case a framework that comes bundled with Python today. It has its own mocking framework called mock. That's the name of the module. And you can see that I can set up a mock and I can invoke a method called do it. And then I insert the call count. Do it should have been called one time. 
And then I set the mock a return value and I call it again. And I assert that mock do another returns five. Now this is nice, this is helpful, this is powerful. But if you notice, it also requires of you to have a very intimate knowledge of the framework. So you would have never guessed that core count is an attribute or that return value is an attribute of those constructs, of the mock construct. You have to go into the um, uh, documentation and read up and, oh, oh you know, if you want to assert core count, use a core count attribute. Not very memorable, if you ask me. So how does Nimoy solve that? Using a DSL. Using the DSL, we can rewrite different operations to mean different things. So if we want to take the example of a constant return value, method core should always return five. In Nimoy, we use the right shift operator. This means every phrase that you write in the when block using the right shift operator, Nimoy will translate that and interpret that as this is the constant value you should return for this method call. And then you can see that inside the event block, every method call following will return the value five. And this test case will pass. And what happens if you want to return different values? I think in unit test, this calls a side effect. Well, we have the same solution as well. And the same way we can use the right shift for a constant return value, we can use here the left shift for a side effect. So if you use the left shift in a when block, every method call will return the next value in the array that you fed to it, just using the left shift operator. Again, this is syntactic sugar. Behind the scenes, it works just as the way as any other mocking framework uh, uh, operates, but it saved you the boilerplate code of writing the different attributes and getting to know the constructs intimately. Now, what happens if you want to do more powerful mocking testing? For example, what happens if I want to assert how many times the method is called? In this case, Nemo gives you a template of assertion. So if you write in the then block uh, an expression like this, one times a method call an argument, this is a whole mocking assertion with two uh, vectors. The first vector is the number of invocations, one times meaning we expect method call to be one called once. And the second vector is the argument. So if we start out by one times the method call, meaning our target mark, then we can carry on to the next vector and say, we expect the argument to equals string argument. And again, this is saving a boilerplate code, which is calling call count, calling return value, calling everything in one line. Now, what happens if you want to use wild cards? For example, what happens if I don't care how many times method call was invoked? I only want to check that it was invoked. Well, Nimoy gives you the feature of wild cards. If you use an underscore in this assertion expression of mocks, well, this is interpreted as a wild card. We don't care how many times method call was invoked. It's any number of invocations or pass, or at least one or zero. Alternatively, you can do the same for arguments. What happens if you want to assert that the method was called, but you don't care what the argument was? You just want to know that something has arrived. Same thing, you can use an underscore as a wildcard. And this means that if you give the method an argument, any argument value will suffice. The test case will still pass. And so you can think of this as sort of an equation, which allows you to write mock assertions, uh, but easier all in one expression and in a clear mathematical view, which is easy to grasp. Next, I want to boast some syntactic sugar, some, I think, uh, features of, of Nemo, which are uh, a bit more fun and also still make life easier, but are not core concepts of, of testing. The first, is how do you handle exceptions? So today, if you want to assert for exceptions in PyTest or similar, you use the when block or the with block as in a context manager. And in that block, you have to assert that something happened. So Nimoy saves you this nesting and saves you those keywords. And it still tries to keep the BDD core concepts into asserting exceptions. And so here in this simplified uh, scenario, you can see that 
an exception is raised in the when block. So any exception that is raised in the when block will be caught by the then block. And so you can see we've introduced a new keyword here. The new keyword is thrown. This means any exception that is thrown in the when can be returned to you. And you can see that you can assert what's the type of the exception and it returns the value in and sets it into error in this example, ERR. And then you can sort of inspect the exception to see that it matches the one that you wanted. So again, cleaner, BDD style, but still gives you the power to assert for exceptions. A second very nice syntactic sugar, which I really like, is regex. Many times you find yourself asserting regex in your test cases. So you want to check that maybe a string contains a certain value or a certain pattern. And so normally you would need to um, call like the, the, the pattern compile or use like a specified uh, assertion method belonging to your framework. In Emo, you don't have to. In Emo, you have the at sign. At sign basically is a regex evaluation. So anything you write in expect or then block with the at sign will be asserted as a regex assertion meaning take the expression and take the uh, regex expression on the right, compile it and assert them, make sure they match. And if they don't match, it fails. Again, reducing boilerplate code. Now what happens with assertions themselves? So we used to think of assertions as simple test cases where you want to check that one value equals another value. And if that fails, the assertion explanation is normally very specific. If we want to assert that A equals B and it fails, it will just say, well, A doesn't equal B. This is okay and it's good, but we have to think and remember that most test cases are a chain of consequences or a chain of actions that brought us to a certain point where something failed. Now, if my fail just says, well, something failed, it doesn't help me much. I would much rather see what was the chain of outcomes that caused this failure to happen? What happened on the way that I didn't get my expectation fulfilled? And in this case, Nimoy helps you as well. In this test case, you can see that we construct a new class called some class. And when you initialize it, you create an attribute called val, which is a hash or an object with a key D and the value E. Now in my expect block, you can see that I assert that the key named D is equal to f. Now this will fail. We can see it fail because we know that d equals e. But how does Nimoy report this failure is a more interesting bit. If we see the example of the assertion failure, you can see that there's a breakdown of this assertion. Now you may be familiar with this sort of assertion reporting with uh, uh, PyTest. PyTest gives you a very similar feature, but PyTest displays this as a tree and not as a graph. Nimoy takes this assertion failure and takes the expression, breaks it down to the values, to a graph of values that happened along the way, and tells you what exactly happened if it failed. And so you can see that it managed to uh, figure out that during runtime, the object named SC was equal to a hash named uh, uh, with the value uh, E and D. And that when we access that value in key D, we get E and E does not equal f, and this is why the assertion return false. So you can think of it as like a graph, which breaks down every value along the way inside this assertion, and then it gives you the whole view, the whole picture of what happened until that point of failure. And this is good for test cases, but it could also be very useful for production code if we ever manage to get it into a, a, a separate library. So this brings me to the end of my different examples. And so I'd like to give you a few more words about Nimoy. First, I'd like to tell you a bit about how it works. Well, Nimoy, first of all, is based on Python 3, meaning if you try to run it in Python 2, it will not work. This is because it uses special constructs and special features of the language. Next is that you should know is that it's all based on the unit test framework, which is bundled with Python meaning Nimoy has a very, very clean graph of dependencies. Next, everything is done using AST. Nimoy manipulates the AST, the abstract syntax tree of the code that you write, and then transforms it into the real Python code. So this is what gives you the magic. This is what gives you the syntactic sugar. 
You can find Nimoy on GitHub uh, in this following URL. We're currently at version 111. And if you're interested a bit to hear about how Nimoy is built, you can find building Nimoy on Medium. If you're into helping out and uh, donating source code, well, I always need help. Now I specifically need help with IDE integrations, how to get Nimoy to work with PyCharm or VS Code and similars. This will also make a huge jump in terms of Nimoy. So if anyone is interested in helping out with this, I'd be super glad about that. So I want to thank you for listening to my uh, presentation. I'll be available in Discord for the Q&A. Goodbye.